Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a passenger jet crashes in Ukraine. Nearly 300 are killed. U.S. officials say the plane was shot down. And layoffs by Microsoft are rippling down to their Nokia office in San Diego. And I'm Peggy Pico. A judge rules California's death penalty is unconstitutional. I'll have an in-depth look at what the ruling means to California's 748 death row inmates. Plus, how will the state's new water conservation mandate change the way you use water and why water fines may not be as much as expected? Also tonight, trying to save water gets a Southern California couple in trouble with City Hall. There's been... A changing of the guard at the Temkin Museum in Balboa Park. We'll look at the debate over what it could mean for the museum's future. Where the turf meets the surf, down at Old Del Mar. And the Sport of take Kings returns to Del Mar. Take we'll take you to opening day. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. There's a smile on every Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. A Malaysian jet, airline jet, crashed in Ukraine today, and U.S. intelligence officials believe it was shot down. 295 people were on board the flight from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. Ukraine is blaming pro-Russian separatists for the crash, while Russia says Ukraine is responsible. President Obama says the crash is a terrible tragedy. The United States will offer any assistance we can to help determine what happened and why. And as a country, our thoughts and prayers are with all the families of the passengers, wherever they call home. Most of the passengers on the plane were Dutch citizens. It's not known if there were any Americans on board. The U.N. Security Council will hold an emergency meeting on Ukraine tomorrow morning in response to the crash. Another big story tonight, Israeli forces continue airstrikes on the Gaza Strip and thousands of soldiers invaded. It is the first major Israeli ground offensive in five years. The move comes after a 10-day aerial bombardment failed to halt rocket fire from Gaza into southern Israel and after a failed attempt by 13 Hamas militants to infiltrate Israel through a tunnel under the Gaza-Israeli border. Of course, PBS NewsHour will have more on this story and on the plane crash in Ukraine. That's coming up at 7. San Diego will feel the effect of a massive restructuring of technology giant Microsoft. The company is laying off 18,000 workers. Joining us to talk about what that means for workers in San Diego is KPBS reporter Eric Anderson. Eric, how will the uh, job cuts be felt here? Well, Dwayne, 378 people were told today they are losing their jobs in San Diego. Those people work for Nokia, which was bought a few months ago by Microsoft. Nokia has a research and development center here in San Diego. That office will still exist, but with fewer workers. Now, Microsoft executive and former Nokia CEO Stephen Elop said in a public email that the San Diego office will remain open. He said, quote, while we plan to reduce the engineering in Beijing and San Diego, both sites will continue to have supporting roles, including affordable devices in Beijing and supporting specific U.S. requirements in San Diego, unquote. Elop did not specify what the remaining workers would be doing. Microsoft officials did say that the San Diego workers losing their jobs were all notified during the course of the day today. Yeah, so is the restructuring just focusing on Nokia? Well, in fact, it's not. While many of the people being cut worked for that cell phone company, about 5,500 Microsoft workers also got pink slips today. New Microsoft chief Satya Nadella says this is part of the company's bid to remake itself from a computer and device-focused company to one that focuses on mobile and the cloud. And just to get some perspective on the layoffs, about 15 percent of the company's 125,000 workers are being laid off. That's more than three times the size of the company's previous record for layoffs set back in 2009. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson. A San Diego City Council committee took a look today at a proposed compromise on the city's linkage fee. That's the fee uh, uh, charged to commercial developers. It pays for affordable housing. The compromise comes from a business group and the San Diego Housing Commission. It would return the fee to its original level, 1.5 percent of construction costs. But... Certain types of developments would be exempt, like nonprofit hospitals. Today, 
The council committee sent the idea back to staff for more review. That compromise is expected to be taken up again in September. Highway Patrol investigators have seized the medical records of a woman involved in a videotape beating incident in Los Angeles seen here. 51-year-old Marlene Pinnock has been in the hospital since it happened earlier this month. Her lawyer says investigators took files with statements to her doctor and calls it a violation of privacy. She's filing a federal lawsuit over the seizure. CHP's commissioner has promised a swift investigation. The officer involved has been placed on desk duty. Now, we first told you last night about a federal judge's ruling finding California's death penalty unconstitutional. Peggy Pico is looking at what the ruling means for hundreds of inmates still on death row. Currently, there are 748 inmates in California on death row, many who've been there for decades, including one man whose execution sentence began in 1981. But Wednesday's ruling by a federal judge in Orange County called the death penalty, quote, dysfunctional and, quote, unconstitutional. Here to explain the potential impact of the ruling are my guests, constitutional law attorney Dan Eaton and Lawrence Benner, law professor at California Western School of Law. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to see you. Now, Dan, briefly recap what this case was about, uh, Ernest Dwayne Jones, a convicted murderer, and what he asked the court to do. Right. Uh, he was convicted in 1995 of the 1992 murder of his girlfriend's mother, the rape and murder of his girlfriend's mother. The circumstances were really very gruesome, as a matter of fact. And there was really no dispute about the fact that he did it. So he wasn't contesting whether he was guilty or not. What he was saying was that the manner in which the death sentence was imposed was unconstitutional. And the specific winning argument was that it violated the Eighth Amendment ban on cruel and unusual punishment. And that's what Judge uh, Cormac Carney in Orange County mm -hmm. uh, found. He said uh, unconstitutional, citing uh, decades of delays and also execution uh, infrequency. How would those reasons violate the Eighth Amendment? Well, because, of course, cruel and, uh, the Eighth Amendment bars cruel and unusual punishment, and a part of that is that the death uh, penalty cannot be imposed in an arbitrary way or undue delay. There has to be some reasonable prospect that it's actually going to happen to serve the two purposes of the death penalty, which are deterrence and retribution, meaning expressing moral outrage, society's moral outrage for the seriousness of the offense. I said, look, if you're talking about delays of 25 plus years and you're talking about the randomness in which the death penalty is imposed, you're not satisfying the requirements of the Eighth Amendment. And Lawrence, when was the last time a prisoner was executed in California and what are some of the key reasons for delays in executions? Well, the last execution was in 2006. The reason for the delay, uh, which the judge found, by the way, was systemic in the fault of the state, not due to efforts by the defendant uh, or any inmate to delay their execution. They found these were systemic reasons, uh, and I can just run through a few. Sure. Um, you, you start, it, it goes with the woefully inadequate funding that we have for our criminal justice system, and in particular, the defense of the indigent accused. And I, I suspect all of us are indigent when it comes to a capital case Do where you murder think is the, is the, is the, uh, uh, the penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, and it takes four years on average after the conviction um, for an attorney to be appointed um, before the defendant actually gets an appointed attorney for his direct appeal. After that, it takes another four years on average for the Supreme Court of California to hear that appeal, which is a mandatory, by statute, mandatory appeal. And so it takes roughly, on average, eight to 12 years before the direct appeal is even finalized. After that, the direct appeal, of course, only deals with the matters of record. You have to state post-conviction procedures. Uh, they found that there are some people currently on death row waiting 15 years for the appointment of counsel to handle and, uh, a post-conviction petition. And, and clearly it keeps going on. Do you think that this specific ruling, Lawrence, um, do you anticipate that other death row inmates will use it in these appeals, however far out they are? Oh, absolutely. Um, I don't think there's any question that this uh, is a very thoughtful opinion by the judge. Uh, is going to cause people, all everybody that is, has a pending appeal, and even people whose executions are awaiting, they're 17, awaiting, I would think that they can still raise those issues too. And, uh, and let me ask Dan about mm -hmm. that. How, what kind of influence do you see this having on other rulings, either in this state and or could it uh, progress out to other states? Well, and I think it will be used in other states. Pennsylvania also has a very long death row, and the reaction at Piggy is going to be uh, both in the courts and legislatively. You are going to 
see people like our former governor, for example, who tried to put an initiative on the ballot to speed up the appeals process to make the death penalty more efficient. Of course, Judge Carney said, I'm not necessarily encouraged speeding it up too much because the fact is on these side appeals uh, on habeas corpus, you have seen a lot of people have their death sentences reduced. So it'll be very interesting to see not only what happens in the court, but also what happens in the court of public opinion, meaning the state legislatures and the initiative process for those states that have them. I'll ask both of you this, and we'll have to end on this because we're almost out of time. Do you think this will go to the uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in California and ultimately to the Supreme Absolutely. Court? Absolutely. You do. What it's about up to you, Kamala Harris, who is still reviewing the ruling, and she may not appeal this. If she doesn't, it isn't binding authority on other courts in California, but it's still going to be persuasive, and other courts are going to still use it. I'm sure we'll be talking about this a lot more. Attorney Dan Eaton and Law Professor Lawrence Benner, thank you. Sure, nice thank to you. see you. Californians will vote in November on whether Congress should amend the Constitution to limit the influence of campaign donations in elections. The vote would be only advisory, but the lawmaker who proposed it says it would allow Californians to send a message to Congress. In 2010, the Supreme Court ruled it was unconstitutional to limit independent expenditures by corporations and labor unions. Border Patrol reports a slowdown in the flood of immigrant children coming to Texas. Agents had been taking in as many as 300 a day at the height of the surge, but yesterday, just 80. The news comes as Congress continues debating President Obama's request for $3.5 billion to handle the surge. One sticking point, a 2008 law requiring Central American migrants be treated as refugees instead of being deported immediately. A new federal earthquake map dials up the shaking hazard a bit for about a third of the U.S. Of course, California has always been a high-risk area, but the new map also shows greater danger in places like Oklahoma and Tennessee. It takes into account research from the earthquake and tsunami off Japan and a surprise quake in Virginia three years ago. Fire restrictions in Cleveland National Forest will increase tomorrow morning due to high temperatures and dry vegetation under the stricter rules Wood and charcoal fires are only allowed in certain areas. Spark arresters are required on off-highway vehicles and various equipment. And smoking is prohibited, except in certain areas. And permits are required for activities such as welding and cutting. Now next week, the County Water Authority will decide if San Diego should follow a state mandate to reduce our water use during this prolonged drought. Peggy Pico has more on the issue. Joining me with more on what the new state water mandate means to you and your neighbors are my guests, Dana Freehoff, Water Resources Manager for County Water Authority, and Travis Pritchard with, the, with San Diego Coast Keeper. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Dana, how does the water authorities here in San Diego, the, the recommendation for a level two drought ordinance compare to the state's new mandate? Right. Well, we think, um, you know, really the state has taken an unprecedented move in, in requiring uh, mandatory water use restrictions statewide. And we believe our staff recommendation to have our member agencies, the retail agencies, um, go to a mandatory level, go to a level two, is consistent with what the emergency regulations are calling for. And specifically, what are the recommendations here in San Diego County for water users? Well, for example, we're going to look at not washing down driveways and um, sidewalks, for example. For example, um, uh, turning off your fountains unless they're recirculating. In fact, um, we're looking at uh, not using the fountain unless uh, with potable water that you have to use recycled water, for example. Um, pair leaks uh, within 72 hours. Um, we're also looking at eliminating uh, runoff when you're irrigating, so you have runoff from your lawns or your landscape. And then also and a look at limiting outdoor watering. So this could mean, for example, three watering days a week um, in the summer, one day a week in the winter. And then also only watering, obviously, during the morning and the evening and not watering in, in the middle of the day. And we're familiar with some of these, but Travis, uh, throughout this drought, the county has relied on these voluntary conservation uh, efforts, saying when to water and, and don't waste this water. Um, do you think that's enough? Voluntary restrictions I don't think are enough. Uh, when you look at the effectiveness of voluntary restrictions versus mandatory restrictions, both in our region and everywhere else, you find mandatory restrictions are vastly more effective than voluntary restrictions. And especially when you look at San Diego specifically, where we have really been conserving over the past 20 years with, with recently our uses have been going up, 
A, a you, slight increase on that, right? About 3.5% last year? We're looking at about 10% in San okay, Diego. Okay, I see. Um, and so when, when you call for voluntary restrictions, I feel like you're really targeting the people who already are conserving. And it's not until you get to mandatory conservation that you start to bring in the people who haven't yet stepped up their game. And, and Damon, let's talk about that. It was widely reported that the um, non-compliant residents would face fines of upwards of $500 under the state mandate. Will those fines uh, apply to San Diego County? Um, it's going to be up to the local jurisdiction. Um, the cities and the water districts have ordinances in place um, for, for these different levels of mandatory water use restrictions. And in those ordinances, they will have enforcement mechanism, enforcement process. So really, the state has given you the tool to fine up to $500 um, per violation per day, but um, it's really going to be the local agencies that's going to enforce it based on their um, enforcement mechanism in place. Um, and I do want to say the 10% um, increase in water use is just this last few months because it's been so hot here in San Diego County. And, and we will get back to that. I did want to touch on the fines just one more time. So mm -hmm. uh, people should call their local water uh, distributor basically to find out uh, about the fines and, and the restrictions, correct? Great, yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because they, they should. Um, we're a wholesale agency. Um, we deal with our retail agencies and they should contact their retail agency to find what's in place. Who, who enforces these fines? Are we having neighbors uh, report neighbors? or how, how, do, how do you find out about this and, and who enforces them? Yeah, it will be an outreach from the local agencies uh, and then it'll be up to them what tools they want to use to have it enforced. Okay, and um, I understand starting August 1st, all California water agencies, as you're talking about the wholesale election, will be required to report water usage to the state, correct? Mm -hmm. um, the governor's goal is 20% conservation. What would be an acceptable level of water conservation here in San Diego County? Well, it's, it's a struggle here. As Travis mentioned, we have done a great job conserving here in San Diego County. Our water use is down already 20% since 2007. Um, so we are going to look for an, uh, a reduction. Um, our, our model ordinance has an up to 20% reduction. And so we're going to encourage residents and businesses to do whatever they can um, to conserve. And, and let me end with this with you, Travis. What do you think uh, else could be done as far as conserving water? Uh, the fines, are the regulations uh, adequate? Well, the, it's up, really up to the juris jurisdictions, like Dana said. Uh, if the jurisdictions don't step up their enforcement of these mandatory restrictions, then really what you have is consequence-free mandatory restrictions, which is just voluntary restrictions, and that doesn't work. Um, we would like to see a 20% or greater conservation effort in San Diego. Being water importers who import where 100% of our water comes from drought-stricken areas, we have the responsibility to really use our water as effectively as possible since we are borrowing it from other areas. All right, well, there's a lot more about this on our website, kpbs.org. Travis Pitchard and Dana Friel, thank you very much. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, as we just heard, we are all being urged to conserve water, but a couple in Glendora, just north of us, say they got a warning letter because they're not watering enough. In fact, their lawn's gone brown because they cut back on watering. The warning from the city says, if it's not green again in 60 days, they could be hit with a fine of up to 500 bucks. Glendora's city manager says conservation is important, but appearances have to be kept up so property values don't drop. He says homeowners should check into the city's turf removal program. I'm Judy Woodruff. On the next news hour, Margaret Warner sits down with the Palestine Liberation Organization's ambassador to the United States. That's Thursday on the PBS News Hour. Some surprising news from the museum world here in San Diego. The director of the Temkin Museum of Art abruptly left, and a veteran art conservator was hired to replace him. KPBS culture reporter Angela Carone looks at what it might mean for the future of this small but cherished museum. The Timken Museum of Art might be the most overlooked museum in Balboa Park. Its mid-century design looks different than the other museums. Inside, there's a stellar collection of old master paintings, including the only Rembrandt in San Diego. The Timken is free, yet it remains kind of a secret, says Tim Zinn, president of the Timken Board of Trustees. I think that the, it's been like 
kind of in the past when it was first started a little club, like a little clubhouse. And those that knew about it knew about it. That started to change under John Wilson, who was the museum's director for the last six years. But two weeks ago, Wilson abruptly resigned, citing a difference of opinion with the board on the museum's future. Hugh Davies directs the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego. He says Wilson's departure does not bode well for the Timken. Its potential was finally being tapped by John Wilson, and I can't for the life of me figure out why you would nip that in the bud. And I can only think that it comes from the leadership of the board. Zinn says Wilson was a great curator, but the board wanted a different fundraising and administrative approach. It's where you put your time, and he's been here for six years, okay? And sometimes it's just time to repot a plant. They've hired 80-year-old David Bull to replace Wilson. His title is visiting director. David Bull is a rock star of art. He is one of the top four restorers of art in the world not in the United States, in the world. Bull chairs the Painting Conservation Department at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Here he is narrating a lecture on painting restoration. Dosso repainted most of the landscape, leaving the figures intact. Bull lives in New York City and won't be available for an interview for two months. He will give the museum 20% of his time. Only a portion of that will be in San Diego. But Zinn says Bull's expertise will be important when the Timken wants to buy a painting for the collection or mount a special exhibit. One of the things we feel David does for us is give us a whole creative perspective of new sources of art. He knows where art is because he's restored a lot of that art. Buying a painting or mounting a special exhibit requires money and fundraising. Zinn and the board believe Bull can raise funds in San Diego. Hugh Davies disagrees. David Bull will not be able to raise money. You have to know people and have known them for a long time. You have to be invested in the community. Um, he is just a parachuting in five or six times a year for cocktail parties and openings. This is a tough time for a leadership change, as 2015 marks the Timkins' 50th anniversary. The museum was founded when the Putnam sisters, who were unhappy with the leadership of the San Diego Museum of Art, pulled their funding and decided to build a separate collection. Their lawyer, Walter Ames, helped them set up the Timken in 1965 to display it. Members of the Ames family then ran the museum until Wilson was hired in 2008. He was the first arts professional to run the museum. With his departure, Hugh Davies says the museum leadership is retreating instead of growing the museum. It has the feeling of a very hidebound, old institution. And for the good of San Diego, that needs to be overcome. I mean, this is, this is a non-profit. All of us own that collection. It's not owned by a small group of family members. Tim Zinn isn't worried. He has another year as board president, and he says he has a plan. I call uh, the Timken Museum, Museum of Art the uh, Center of Art, Energy, and Fun in Bar Balboa Park. It's going to be fun. I'm going to make 2015 a very successful 50th anniversary celebration for the Temkin that started in 1965. Angela Carone, KPBS News. From art to the sport of kings, it's horse racing season at Del Mar. KPBS videographer Roland Lizarondo gives us a look at opening day. Oh, the favorite part of the races is the horses, of course, and wearing our beautiful hats on opening day. My hat, by the way, is an original from San Diego 1900s, Marston's Department Store. Who's got the action? Who take a chance on love? Who's got a kiss for me? Give me one when you get back three. Who's got the action? Just lay it on the line. I'll bet you ten to one, you be mine. Now once I had a feeling... 14 BC, but we're here today at the horse. Right Happy opening day at Del Mar Racetrack. By the way, Hawk's Eyes won the first race of the day at Del Mar. It runs through uh, September 3rd, but there will also be a mini meet in November. 
Nice weather for heading to the races. A mix of sun and clouds along the coast with temperatures mostly in the mid 70s over the next few days. For the inland valleys, we're talking upper 70s, maybe even low 80s by Sunday. Sunny in the mountain areas, temperatures there in the upper 70s. And a typical July weekend ahead for the desert, temperatures in the triple digits. Recapping tonight's top stories, a Malaysian Airlines jet crashed in Ukraine today, and U.S. intelligence officials believe it was shot down. 295 people were on board the flight from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. Ukraine is blaming pro-Russian separatists for the uh, crash, while Russia says Ukraine is responsible. President Obama says the crash is a terrible tragedy. The United States will offer any assistance we can to help determine what happened and why. And as a country, our thoughts and prayers are with all the families of the passengers, wherever they call home. Most of the passengers on the plane were Dutch citizens. It's not known if there were any Americans on board. The U.N. Security Council will hold an emergency meeting on Ukraine tomorrow morning in response to the crash. And Microsoft is laying off 378 people from its Nokia offices here in San Diego. It's part of a worldwide cutback for the tech company. In all, Microsoft is uh, laying off about 15 percent of its workforce. The company says it's part of a bid to reinvent itself from a computer and device focused company to one focused on mobile and the cloud. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.